Get over here! Okay, so I wanted to have a conversation with you guys about Google's upcoming phone, the Pixel 6. Now, a couple weeks ago, Google announced the product. They showcased both the Pixel 6 and the Pixel 6 Pro, and they also had some details about their upcoming SOC, Google Tensor. Now, at the time, I had some mixed thoughts about this whole thing, right? There's a part of me that was really excited about this launch. I like the design aesthetic of it. I like the look of the camera bar, and the whole idea of custom SOC on a Google phone is really neat, right? The potential and the possibilities of that are very, very cool. However, there's another part of me that was concerned. And it's because over the past few years, when you look at Google's hardware, it's a lot of hit and miss, right? Some stuff is good, some stuff is reasonably priced, but there's a lot of stuff that was expensive and didn't really pan out the way that I think the consumers wanted it to. So there's a discussion to be had. So I'm gonna start off with the phones themselves. The Pixel 6 has a 6.4 inch 90 hertz display with flat edges. It's got an under display fingerprint sensor. And then on the back, there's a 50 megapixel main camera that's supposedly using the Samsung GN1, which is a very capable sensor. It's a big, beefy sensor. And then there's also a ultra wide beside that. There's also a reported 4,600 milliamp hour battery, but then powering all of this is the Google Tensor chip. Now, if you look at the Pixel 6 Pro, same idea on the inside, it's got that same Tensor chip, but because it's a bigger phone, it's got a bigger battery, 5,000 milliamp hours supposedly, and a third camera lens. This is a 4X optical periscope telephoto, so it's a fairly capable zoom lens. And then up on the front, we have the under display fingerprint sensor as well as a larger screen, so 6.7 inches, but this is also a little bit faster at 120 hertz. But there is a bit of a curve on that front glass on the Pro model. So there's a lot to talk about here, but I wanna focus first on that SOC, Google Tensor. So this is not actually a true custom SOC. And not like in the sense that M1 or Apple's Bionic chips are. Those are truly custom solutions. Apple designs a product in-house. It gets fabricated to Apple's exact specifications, like whatever Apple wants or doesn't want, that is what comes out, right? And that's what gets delivered to the customer. With this thing, Google Tensor, it's a solution that's built in, I guess that the whole thing is done through Samsung, right? It's a program that Samsung has where companies can work with Samsung to deliver a product that's kind of like a tweaked or modified version of their existing IPs or IPs they have access to, right? So stuff like Exynos, uh, they can tweak it, they can modify it, they can potentially add elements to the chip, but it's not a completely custom solution. So I see this idea of like, you know, maybe it'll have amazing energy efficiency that we've never seen before. In a like, no, it, it can't. It has to be based off of Samsung's existing stuff, so it'll be akin to whatever they've had before. Now, they do get to add to it, so I'm sure Google's gonna put in stuff like their Pixel Visual Core, their Neural Core, and whatever AI or machine learning stuff that they have up their sleeve. If they can put it in, I'm sure they will, but there is a limitation as to how much you can really modify this chip based on this existing process. It's kind of like AMD that works with different companies to create different products off of the same architecture, right? They work with Microsoft to make the Xbox Series X. They work with Sony to create the PlayStation 5. They work with Dell to create, you know, some custom all AMD gaming laptop. All three products are different in the sense that the end solution is a little bit different, but the overall capability of each device is quite similar. And that's what would be happening with Google Tensor and any kind of existing Samsung chip. Now, the good thing is that the benefits of Google being able to tweak and modify this chip and add their own components to it is that the image processing can be heavily tuned and optimized for that specific camera sensor that's in here, the Samsung GN1. And I'm a firm believer that this Pixel 6 and the Pixel 6 Pro are gonna have amazing camera capabilities, both in photography and videography. Like when you grab a sensor that's as big as that thing is and as capable as the GN1, you combine it with hardware like this, you can't go wrong. There's no way that it's gonna have just kind of good images. It's gonna have pictures and videos that I think will push the whole smartphone industry. I really think that. But this is where my concern kind of kicks in. If you rewind time back to 2000 and, I wanna say 2017, the year the Pixel 2 came out, the Pixel 2 XL, those devices were fantastic. Like the images that came off of those just blew people away. I think that was the year they added the Pixel Visual Core and it was amazing. Like the computational photography back then, it was so impressive. It was so different from what everyone else was doing, but it wasn't enough. Like all the marketing material, all the angles, all the ads you saw from Pixels were like, look how good our photography is. Compare us to the iPhone 10. Compare us to the Samsung products. We're so much better. But even with such an amazing camera system, 
they couldn't capture a big market, right? Both the Pixel 2 and the Pixel 3 struggled with sales. It was weird, right? You have this phone that has an amazing camera system, arguably the best. It's seemingly the thing that matters, right? Why aren't more people buying this device? Maybe price, maybe a whole bunch of other things. Maybe they aren't advertising enough. But the point I'm trying to make is that even if Pixel 6 has the world's, like, you know, the empirically best camera system, nothing can touch it, is that enough? Is that enough to pull people over to a product? I don't know. I'd love to see this thing just pop off. I would love it to do really well, but it doesn't seem like it's worked in the past. And if you take a look at the countries of availability, India's not on there, at least not at the launch. So it's weird that a huge market like that could potentially miss out on a really cool phone. Now, I bring all of this stuff up because it's not like I, I'm stoked for the phone. I think it's really cool. I think the hardware is really cool. But in order for this to work, in order for Google's new path to work. It has to sell with scale. There has to be a lot of people buying this stuff, right? And because it's custom, right? When you'd have semi-custom chips like this, it's not just buying stuff from Qualcomm, and, and right? It's it's an expensive product. And in the past, Google's tried all the other stuff. They've tried mid-range stuff. They've tried cheap stuff. They've tried expensive stuff that had kind of mid-range hardware. And this is the first time they're launching an expensive phone with expensive hardware, like truly expensive hardware inside there. And it's like, if this doesn't work, I, I don't know. What if Pixel gets axed in like two or three years because it didn't pan out? That would suck because as a tech enthusiast, like you want to see this stuff excel. You want to see a Google phone with custom Google hardware in there just become something that would be amazing. That would be the dream. But the thing you have to keep in mind always with Google, they're not a hardware company. This is like a blip in their whole plan, right? This is just meant to enable, hopefully, other stuff that they do, like advertising models and whatever they do with Google, right? The real Google business is with software and advertising. This hardware stuff is just, it's a, it's a, it's a side thing. And if it would work, that'd be cool. Really cool. Okay. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thumbs if you liked it. Subs if you loved it. I'll see you guys next time.